speedrun, let's go. In 1998, Damon Albarn of Blur fame and Jamie Hewlett of Tangirl fame formed the band Gorillaz after watching too much MTV and going, ah! We have our four fictional characters, Russell the drummer, Noodle the guitarist, Tootie the vocalist, and Murdoch the bassist. Murdoch owns the band, but didn't get the job of the lead singer due to him not having a very pretty voice, so Tootie got the job instead. I'm sure all you avid Gorillaz fans know the rest of the backstory by this point. Russell was kidnapped, but stayed with Gorillaz because he liked the music. Murdoch tried robbing a keyboard shop and ended up driving his car right into Tootie's face, along with a separate incident where Tootie was shot out the front of Murdoch's windshield and landed face first into a car which gave him a second look. And Noodle was sent from Japan in a FedEx crate. The band's first release was the Tomorrow Comes Today single in November of 2000. Due to the single having four tracks on it, the release had to be labeled as an EP, but it's technically still just the first single for the band. After they gained some traction, they released Clint Eastwood in March of 2001, which made them explode! Another reason for the explosion was the video that accompanied it. So, two hit singles and a debut album coming out in a few days? What does Wonder do? Well, do what any band would do to start some promotion. Do a gig. Doing a live performance as a cartoon band is not a very difficult concept to pull off nowadays. Just make some pre-rendered 3D videos of the characters performing to a black background, and then project that onto a translucent film slash screen. The problem is that in 2001, the technology to do this sort of thing wasn't available, so they had to start brainstorming ideas for alternatives. At this point in time, Damon and Jamie were really trying to push the fact that the cartoon band was musicians and that they were really the ones putting together all the tunes. So, simply putting on a concert where Damon gets up on stage and plays the album live with a band while claiming to be gorillas didn't seem like the right choice at the time. The best way to present an animated cartoon band, I guess, would be the way that most cartoons are presented, on a screen. The stage format used for the early gorilla shows consisted of the stage being covered by a screen while projections were shown which would play along with the music. The live band would perform behind the screen as stage lights were put behind them so that their silhouettes would appear on the screen along with the projections. The technology does not exist to do exactly what we want to do on stage. So the, li the live show was the one thing that uh, didn't come easy. I mean, everything else with Google, we had it pretty figured out from the start, but the live show was something that we couldn't quite get our heads around. So basically what you have is a giant cinema screen on stage, and you have a live band standing behind the screen um, playing the music. And onto the screen we project and animation and flash animation and, and images and live action and, and just all kinds of stuff really. So it, it's, it's a real experiment the live show, it's uh, different. Now that the concept of the live shows is all figured out, the next thing needed is a band. Vocals of course would be taken over by Damon Albarn. And as for the rest of the band, we have a mix of new and old faces. Junior Dan, a reggae slash roots bass player who played with people such as Augustus Pablo, Bob Marley, and other reggae greats, was the bass player for the tour. He played bass on various tracks for the album itself, so he had already been involved with Gorillaz for a while. He can be seen mainly using a right-handed J bass turned over to be played as a left-handed. Simon provided live guitar and occasional backup vocals for the tour. Simon was a new face brought in for the tour and added his own riffs and licks to songs which gave songs a fresh new sound. He can be seen using a mix of different guitars, such as a Telecaster or an SG. Cass had been involved with the making of the album and was responsible for writing all the character dialogue when gorillas were interviewed for magazines or radio shows. Cass provided drums for the show. He can be seen using Yamaha drums along with a Roland Octopad Pad 80 for additional electronic sounds. Haruka provided backup vocals and was the so to say noodle of the live tour. 
Haruka was given an unplugged Les Paul along with a replica of Noodle's radio helmet to give the appearance of being Noodle behind the screen. She would often speak as Noodle between songs to give up the impression that gorillas really were behind the screen playing all the tunes. She was brought in early on in gorillas to perform as a voice actor for Noodle, so she's a familiar face to the group. I think we have a band. Nice one. Nice band. Okay. Okay, come on. Let's go get a keyboard player. Huh? We've got to get a keyboard player and then uh, we have a band. Mike was the last person brought in to perform with the band. Mike provided keys, synth, flute, and the occasional sax. Mike can be seen using an Akai MX-1000, a Yamaha Clappy Nova, and some unidentified MIDI controller. Although there was someone in charge of DJing, I'm unsure of whether it was Darren Galea or Dan the Automator. Firelife were brought in as the rappers for the Gorillaz Live Tour to perform on Clint Eastwood and Rock the House. Now that there's a band, booking a first gig seems to be like the best idea. The live band booked a month of rehearsals at Depot Studios in London's Holloway Road area before booking a gig on the 22nd of March, 2001, four days before the release of a self-titled album. The set was performed consisted of M1A1, Tomorrow Comes Today, Slow Country, Five Four, Starshine, Man Research Clapper, Soundcheck Gravity, Latin Simone, Rehash, Clint Eastwood, Rock the House, Dracula, Punk, and an encore involving the Sweetie Eerie version of Clint Eastwood. With a month of practicing and doing a few exclusive shows for test audiences, it was time to get up on the Scout stage and put on a show. What are you expecting tonight? Uh, I don't know. I think it's either going to be projections with a band behind it, or a band with projections behind them, or something that I haven't imagined. Oh. And yourself? I'm just with him. <laughs> you, you gonna pay peanuts? You gonna get monkeys. You pay top dollar, you get gorillas! Phase 1 shows played out the same, with the audience loving it and the critics usually disliking it. Of course there were a few sprinkled in critics who applauded their attempts at a live show, but most of the time the critics just didn't understand the concept and found it tiresome or boring. Luckily, the audience still showed great reception, so more gigs were booked. Audio of the Scowl show was broadcasted for a few months on the Gorillaz website back in 2001, along with MTV airing seven selections of the show on TV. On March 26, 2001, Gorillaz released their self-titled debut album, which became an instant hit, selling over 7 million copies worldwide, earning them a three-time platinum in the UK. With a new fan base that now knew all the Gorillaz tunes and how they went, it was time to get back to gigging. Can we go home now, please? I've really had enough of Paris. Please. I've had my sandwich. <laughs> I've spilled my Bollinger. I want to go home. <laughs> The live band then took a two month long break apart from each other just to chill and met back in May before booking another gig at Le Seagull in Paris, France on the 22nd of June. The set list now had the addition of 192000, inserted after Dracula, with its visual featuring an early animatic of the music video. The audience seemed to love the hell out of the performance with them staying 15 minutes after the set had ended requesting an encore which, 
Although unplanned for, they provided. The encore took a while to get going due to the crew already unplugging equipment, and only until the staff of the venue told them to go back on out of a response of the audience not leaving did they go on. For the encore, they repeated Tomorrow Comes Today in Clint Eastwood. All in all, reviews of the show seemed to be mainly positive. The show was streamed to part of PlayLouder.com's Virtual Glastonbury 2001, due to the festival being canceled that year out of safety fears. After that, a full video of the show was hosted for a while on Gorillas.com. Although the server hosting the video is now shut down, you can easily find the full performance on YouTube. This show happened on the 24th of June at the Olympia Theater. There's hardly any info of this show online as far as I can see and remember, but Stephen Murdoch claiming in Rise of the Ogre, I don't remember playing this gig at all. With a gig played in Ireland, France, and the UK, it's time to head back to the home of the guitarist, Noodle. Gorillaz performed two back-to-back -back dates in Japan, one on the 17th of August at the Imperial Hall in Osaka, and the second being on the 18th of August at the Makuhari Messi Live Stage in Shiba, which was a part of Sonic Mania 2001, a mini dance festival a part of the Summer Sonic Festival. There isn't a lot of info about the Osaka gig online from what I could find, and as far as the Sonic Mania gig, it's reported the gig was delayed until 1am, so technically this gig happened on the 19th of August. On the DVD for the 2008 documentary Bananas, a bonus segment was included that's all about their two performances in Japan. It features an interview with both Damon and Jamie. After returning from Japan, the band went on a five-day UK tour, kicking off at Creamfields Festival in Liverpool on the 25th of August. The show seemed to be another hit with the crowd, with them returning for an encore and performing the Sweetie Eerie version of Clint Eastwood, which can be found on YouTube easily. The gig spawned a small mini-site dedicated just to the performance, which you can easily find using the Wayback Machine via fan.gorillas.com. And, according to pictures shown on the site, the real-life Jeep showed up at some point. Next stop is Edinburgh, at the Corn Exchange. This gig occurred on the 24th of September. The gig had supposedly been booked in June, but got pushed to September due to poor ticket sales. For their Birmingham gig on the 25th, they performed the O2 Academy, another standard set with the same encore as the last gig. A fan site was spawned out of this, which hosted some pics of the event. For their Manchester gig on the 26th, they performed at the Manchester Academy, another standard set with the same encore as the last gig. Ending the UK tour is the gig on the 28th at the Forum in Kentish Town, London. This gig stands out as being the only one on the tour where all the voice actors were present to speak as their characters between songs with Remy Kabaka Jr. as Russell, Phil Cornwell as Murdoch, Nelson DeFridis as Tootie, and Haruka already filling in her position as Noodle. This gig was as solid as ever, the only fluke really being that they messed up during 5-4, so they repeated that in Clint Eastwood for the encore. An edited audio version of this gig can be found on YouTube in very high quality, and while there is a full audio recording of this gig, its quality is not great. Thus wraps up the UK tour. Gorillaz performed two benefit shows made for the crisis in Afghanistan. The first show was at the Academy in Bristol on the 15th of December, and the second show being on the 17th of December at the Fabric in London. All profits went to the British Red Cross and Red Crescent. With 12 shows over the span of 9 months reaching the UK, France, Dublin, and Japan, the live band took a bit of a break to get to work on other things. 
the big one being the performance at the 2002 Brit Awards on the 20th of February. The performance involved 3D animations of the cartoon band playing along to a live session recording of Clint Eastwood. Due to the project and animation on a translucent screen concept not really being fully developed at this point, the animations were separated into four towering screens with each member having their own. Accompanying this was a larger screen above the four which showed a multi-angled version of the band playing. And, along with that, they brought in a team of choreographed dancers dressed in a fashion style similar to that of the girls in the 5-4 music video. In total, the whole production cost about £300,000 to make, and even though the spectacle was impressive, Gorillaz left the awards with nothing. After two months, the band booked an 11-date tour, with one date in Canada, one date in Mexico, and nine in the USA. The stage format had to now be changed due to the band performing on much larger stages and huge halls. The setup now consisted of two screens. The one on top was a proper cinema screen, which showed the already existing visuals used in 2001. The screen on the bottom was a bunch of scrims like layered together, with simple images projected that. on to accompany like the main ones on top. The bottom screen was now the main one that the silhouettes of the band appeared on. Along with that, the performance now included the Gorillaz bites, which were now projected between songs. Hey Our Toys Arrived played after Slow Country, Game of Death played after Soundcheck Gravity, and after the encore, they would play Jump the Gut and Free Tibet. The only new addition to the lineup was Jamal Gray, better known as The Last Emperor. He replaced Five Life Cypher for all dates on the US tour. With the band brought back together, it was time to hit the road. What the fuck are we going to do? What the fuck are we even doing here? Well, this right. lovely we stage. We don't have a fucking bass player. Well, we'll be all right, though, because we have our bass. We'll it will sound really cool. It might sound really cool, you know? You never know. It might you never know. You never you know. So let's just sort of keep our sort of uh, you keep morale, up. morale up. The debut gig at the docks in Toronto, Canada on the 22nd of February, 2002. Upon arriving to Canada, Junior Dan, the bassist, was apprehended and arrested due to drug and firearm charges from several years ago. Of course, Junior Dan being arrested sent the band into a nervous wreck, not knowing what they were going to do. If you don't know how much losing a bass player affects your sound, a song like Feel Good Inc., which sounds like this, would sound like this. Get the picture? Cool. Let's move on. Damon attempted to acquire bass duties, which he did tackle for a few songs, but it obviously shows before the show that he's a complete wreck. Just get some music back on. But not yeah, today. Yeah, I'm yeah, just for a minute. Just for a minute. Nerves, he's new. He's <laughs> new in the game. Whoa. Hmm? Do you want some water? Can I have a cocktail? Suck yours. <laughs> With the show being delayed a few times so Damon could gather his strength, they finally went up onto the stage. Overall, seemed to play out just fine. Some songs didn't require Damon to play bass due to Mike Smith, the keyboardist, already having to play synth bass on songs like M1A1, Rehash, and Slow Country. However, complaints did arise. Of course some were confused by the performance, but a main complaint had by most was the venue of choice. The docks was said to be too narrow of a venue for everybody to see the whole presentation, with most residing to the bar area to watch the show from there. Thankfully for those who couldn't attend the gig, the show was streamed to selected movie theaters across Canada the following day. On their way out of Canada, they picked up a new bassist, Roberto Acipinti. Roberto was hired as a replacement for Junior Dan for the remainder of the tour and learned the entire set list within just one night. Roberto brought in a new flavor for the bass parts, bringing in effects to his bass that really made it stand out. Effects such as the synth pedal, which made his bait emulate the sound of a synth bass. Roberto was seen mainly using a P bass. With a new bassist, the band was back to its former self and proceeded with the tour. Gorilla's first date in the States, the Avalon Ballroom in Boston, Massachusetts on the 25th of February. Dan the Animator was the opening act for this gig and DJed up on the balcony of the venue. 
But some pics did spawn from this gig, thankfully. The URL I found them from seems to have disappeared, but they did source from a fan review. First US gig down, eight to go. On to the Capitol. Gorillaz performed at the 930 Club on the 26th of August in Washington, DC. While well, I can't seem to find any reviews online for the gig, an NPR program was made about the Gorillaz around this time and featured a muffled clip of them playing Tomorrow Comes Today at some point in the background. Their live show was high tech and high concept. A video screen at the very top of the stage showed cartoons, geometric shapes and colors, and the band's music videos. But pay no attention to the band behind the curtain. Most of the stage was covered with gauzy scrims. If the lights hit just right, you could see silhouettes of the band, which, by the way, didn't feature most of the high-profile musical guests from the album. Gorillaz made their New York debut at the Hammerstein Ballroom on the 28th of February. This gig seems to be one that stands up the most from the tour, due to the fact that at the end, performers actually stepped out. No, not the actual band itself, but the featured artist of the night. For this gig, Gorillaz performed a second encore, playing their D12 featured song 911, a song made in response to the September 11th attacks. While the band played the song, the rappers stood in front of the screen on stage and did their part in front of the audience. The performance of 911 was included as a part of the Gorillaz Spotify special We Are 10. Another guest featured at the gig was Terry Hall, who also performed on the track 911, but also supplied vocal duties for the Space Monkeys project. Terry Hall supplied guest vocals on M1A1, which gave the song a bit of a mix of Gorillaz and Space Monkeys. on over to Philly, Gorillaz played at the Electric Factory on the 1st of March. The gig is one of the two on the tour that features a custom-drawn poster just made for the gig. This concert holds the record of being the one gig on the US tour that spawned the most amount of pictures. The more documentation, the better. Gorillaz now headed over to Illinois to play at the Aragon Ballroom on the 3rd of March. Just another pretty standard gig on the tour. Everything going as planned. We have our first bootleg of the U.S. tour. Gorillas head up to the Northwest to Seattle, Washington to play at the Paramount Theater on the 5th of March. Although bootlegs had appeared before this one online, this is the earliest known recorded bootleg of the U.S. tour. It is the only bootleg of the tour to feature everything included, from the beginning with Liquidator being played over the PA to the free to bit bite at the end. This bootleg includes everything. While reviews of this gig cannot be found online, the gig sounds to have gone well from the recording. Gorillaz move on down to California to play at the Warfield in San Francisco on the 7th of March. This show is one of the most well-known U.S. tour bootlegs, being the earliest U.S. tour bootleg to appear online. The show is pretty standard, with only a few things making it stand out, one being that it's the second show on the tour to have its own custom-made poster. The other thing to make it stand out is that Mike Smith seems to mess up the keyboard part for some reason during Slow Country, but I have a feeling it was more than just him and it was probably some computer issue. Gorillaz moved down to LA to play two back-to-back -back dates on the 8th and 9th of March at the Palladium. Reviews online go to explain that the first gig didn't hit as hard due to the security lights being on the entire gig, so the projections couldn't be seen as easily. The second gig seems to have been the better of the two. Around 2016, I was doing some basic searches to find any content I could of the Phase 1 shows, when I came across a Brazilian video streaming site that had supposedly been hosting three videos from one of the two Palladium gigs. Being excited, I ripped it and uploaded it to YouTube, being the first and only non-bananas related video online of the US tour. So, after one Canada date and nine American dates, the tour comes to a close, with only one performance left. Gorilla's first endeavor into Mexican territory is at the Palacio de los Deportes in Mexico City, Mexico on March 11th. This is the only gig on the tour that wasn't sold out, most likely due to the fact that the max capacity of the venue was 26,000, and most of the other venues played out on the US tour were about 2,000 to 5,000. The show reportedly had various audio issues throughout, but not a lot of proof is online to support these claims. Even though the gig held about 10,000 people, a scarce amount of info can even be found online about the gig. Some fan reviews were posted a long while back, but I can't really seem to find any links online that led to those reviews anymore. 
In more recent years, photos have appeared online of the posters used to promote the concert, and other various items I've shown up, like VIP passes. I've only been able to find this single image of the gig online, which appears to be a front row shot of the screens as they play Soundcheck Gravity. So, no pics of what the audience looks like can be found online. Well, that's about it. We've covered all the day's performance. <laughs> Four months after their final gig, a part of the Phase 1 tour, Gorilla squeezed out one last concert at the Isle of MTV Festival in Lisbon, Portugal on July 20th, 2002. The concert is the first concert performed outside of the US tour that utilizes the two-screen setup. It also is the only other time that the rappers performed in front of the screen, with Five Life Cypher returning to deliver their raps on Clint Eastwood and Rock the House. Along with that, they served their own raps on 911, which was brought back exclusively just for this one gig. Highlights of the gig were broadcasted onto MTV, which can be found online. The only other thing to happen stage-wise for Gorillaz in 2002 was another hologram performance on May 4th in Taiwan as a part of the Golden Melody Awards. The show was merely just the hologram performances from the Brit Awards, put on a new stage with Taiwanese rapper Vanessa Wu and Stanley Huang. As seen in images and videos of the Scala and the Seagull gigs, the screen completely covers the stage. While in later UK gig photos, the excess exposed stage is covered with a giant tarp with the Jeep pattern printed all over it. What I think must have happened is that the visuals dimensions were designed specifically for the Scala venue, which had a very wide stage. And then, as more gigs went on, they had to somehow figure out how to cover up the exposed stage. So, as a result, the Jeep tarp was brought in. The visuals used for Clint Eastwood at the Scala gig, which consisted of a montage of clips from the music video, with a slowdown clip of the decaying gorilla surrounding it, was only used for that first gig. The visuals were then replaced at the Paris gig, where the visuals now consisted of a 4x7 grid of various shots from the music video. The original Man Research visuals, which consisted of glitched imagery and the occasional animation of Noodle running by the screen, was only used for the Scala, La Seagal, and Japan shows. After that, the visuals were changed to a colorful compilation consisting of various assets from their music videos, compiled into one giant visual mashup. The visuals from Man Research were used as the opener for the Gorillaz documentary Charts of Darkness, which has the audio replaced with Rehash. In the 2002 DVD, Celebrity Takedown, live visuals from the tour were included as bonus content. The visuals included were M1A1, Tomorrow Comes Today, Soundcheck Gravity, Dracula, Punk, and 5-4. The clip of Rehash being performed in the Live in Japan segment of the Bananas DVD actually consists of footage from two dates. The behind the screen footage is most likely from a Japan gig, but the shot of the audience is from their show at the Palladium. You can easily see the two screens right here. 40 seconds of the La Seagull gig were featured on VH1 in a quality much higher than the footage for the full show found on YouTube. Apart from Damon Albarn, the keyboardist, Mike Smith, is the longest running live member of Gorillaz, with his most recent activity being the Now Now Tour in 2018. The second longest live member was the drummer, Cass Brown, who drummed for every Gorilla show in session from Phase 1 to Phase 3. Gabriel Wallace, who drummed alongside him on the Plastic Beach Tour, has now filled in his shoes on the Humans in Now Now Tour. Well, that's about as much as I can think of for now. I hope you guys now understand exactly what the Phase 1 tour is, and that these shows actually did occur. Because a lot of Gorillaz fans, new and old, don't even think these shows even happened. So yeah, that's about it for me. See ya. Savagery for my raw rhymes of reality. At the speed of sound, I'm running around the clouds to try to defeat us. 